Hi, and welcome to Test Talk. I'm Ed Mobley, and today I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Justin Sebastian and Justin Hankey. Uh, welcome to Test Talk, and thanks for uh, spending time with our audience. Today we're going to talk about test intelligence. Yeah. What is that? So the way I expl explain test intelligence is um, taking the data that's available to you uh, during testing, uh, after testing is complete, to tell you something about the future. So I think everybody understands uh, counts of defects and percentage complete and all these kind of metrics, but um, without kind of the intelligence piece, it's hard to uh, translate those things into useful, usable and useful information. So uh, we can use predictive modeling, we can use historical data to try to um, predict the future about how trends fit into the planned timeline. We can uh, do analytics around trends. Am I is my productivity where I need it to be? Is it over under our benchmarks and that sort of thing? So we call it intelligence because it enables us to make intelligent decisions about testing in our projects. I mean, it sounds like the, the, the so what factor. I mean, we, we've probably seen this. I mean, you, you've probably heard, I, I think they call it the, the information hierarchy. You know, you have a whole bunch of data, but it's hard to make decisions off of that. So you kind of distill it upwards and at the tip of the pyramid, you, you end up with true wisdom and insight. And if I understand you correctly, that, that's really what we're trying to apply here to, to testing. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, I think, you know, when we kind of see the typical uh, testing reports, right, you see defect counts, you see percentage completes, but without that context, it's hard to, the context of the project and what should be happening and what that tells you about the future, it's hard to tell. Like, is 100 defects good? Is it bad? Is it mean that I'm behind? or or you know, ahead of schedule, or yeah. That's right, yeah, and I would say a lot of times it's also adding a bit more context to the numbers. It's it's the modeling piece of it, but also, I like to call it just adding business context so, it's so that the business can understand where we are in a program. So if that's breaking it down by line of business, by some work stream, by some workflow, you get a lot of so what out of that when you can go to the business and say, we're 60% done, right? Everybody sees those numbers. The business says, great, sounds good. Where should we be, first of all? Where are we? And then they also say, of the 60%, what's good, what's not, right? So of the things I care about, maybe here are 10 things I care about. Let's, let's break the testing metrics down by that so I can understand where should I spend some more time, what's in good shape, what's not, and maybe how does that align to my MVP, or maybe should we readjust what our MVP is based on where we are? Now you just threw in an acronym, you're gonna to have to explain it. <laughs> MVP, minimum viable product. So uh, especially now in Agile world, a lot of the business teams are looking at what's the absolute minimum that needs to work for us to get this thing live and get, and get users on the system. So, I mean, what, what you're talking about it sounds a lot like the, uh, the predictive uh, models uh, that we've been using. Uh, maybe you can talk uh, more about that. Did I get that right? You're alluding to our predictive models. Yeah, and I, I think that um, you can use the predictive models in a number of ways, whether it's kind of looking to the future about your, your test execution trends and things like that. When am I going to be completed with testing? But that same concept can be applied to kind of any number of things. So uh, even defect trend information, right? So like Justin was talking about, um, you know, using that information to tell you potential hotspots of, you know, this particular part of functionality has, you know, 80% of the defects. It might sound good that there's only 20 defects left, but if they're all in one place, you might want to look into that and have a have an idea of what's going on. And so you can apply a predictive modeling to look at your defect open rate, your defect closure rate, when am I going to be closing more defects and being opened, things like that. So you can kind of overall have a net trend downward in your defects and you, know, you can have models on particular areas or a whole collective one. Or and, and at the end of the day, this, this just helps stakeholders really understand the duration of the testing effort, you know, when it's going to end based on those dynamic drivers, uh, variables. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the lessons that I've learned in, in applying these type of concepts is that the concepts are reusable in the sense of predictive modeling, trend information, kind of, uh, you know, hotspot information, things like that. Um, but how they're applied is, uh, can vary a lot, right? So based on the project you're on, 
and your circumstances, it might be more meaningful to understand or be able to predict when am I going to be done with testing or when are defects going to be, more defects going to be closed than open or maybe neither of those things may be applied in a different way. And, and so this isn't just a philosophical discussion. I mean, we actually have tooling and techniques uh, around this. I mean, maybe if you can, can discuss that, like, a, again, in the area of predictive modeling, I mean, what, what do we actually bring to the table to, to enable that? I think you have one that you use a lot right now. You call it, kind of call it a hurricane chart, yeah, right? But I chart. think that's <coughs> been pretty effective at uh, a project, right? It has, yeah. I think w what we've seen is that at the most basic level, sometimes you'll see just a percentage, right? Um, and then you'll start to see some folks that have trends that say, maybe not a trend, but more of a historical view that says last week I was 50%, this week I was 60%. You kind of start to see that over time view, and then we've extended that a bit into what we've affectionately uh, coined the hurricane model because it gives you a few different tracks and says, okay, now we're going to take the metrics from the last several weeks. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at history as well and say, based on our trend for the last six weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, whatever we, we need to use, this is where the hurricane's gonna hit. Like, you keep this trend up, it's here, and you plus or minus some percentage, this is what it looks like. So you get a nice little hurricane chart like you might see uh, on the Weather Channel in the in the fall. I remember growing up in Florida, you every night used to sit down on the news, it's like, all right, you know, is this gonna hit us? And, and, and my understanding is that in order to produce those charts, it's just not a, a simple spreadsheet exercise or actually some, some algorithms and some, uh, that's intelligence right. that, that goes into it. Yeah, there's uh, been s a substantial effort on pulling that data out of our testing tools. Uh, cleaning it up is, is actually a big piece of it, right? Because everybody uses the tools uh, differently in terms of their folder structure and how they name things and their defects or their test cases. And then coming up with a common denominator and all those metrics so that we can plug it into the tool and see, uh, see where the hurricane's going to hit. And I think what we've what we've seen work really well is that a lot of times you get to the very end, you get 75% of the way through and realize you have a problem. With the with the modeling, you can start looking at that two, three weeks in as soon as you start to have a trend and say, wow, we're doing really well or we're not doing we're so well, let's make some changes. Yeah. And, and a, a client recently said to me, which really said a lot, was that when we're, when we're looking at these charts, if we wait until two weeks before, we have to make huge changes to make this chart move a day or two or a week. If we're looking at it on the left, we make tiny changes in this in this chart really changes moves the track. a lot, a lot. Yeah, and I think it's aptly named a hurricane chart because you don't see a hurricane make a, a big hockey stick, right? right. They're, they're, they're gradual uh, changes due to something that, you know, happened, you know, much, much uh, earlier. And, and so it's my understanding that when we begin a project, because we may not have historical data from that particular client, we pull in historical data from like clients, is, is that correct? Yeah, and so, um, so one of the models that we have is based on a concept called time series linear regression. Um, yeah, it's been around for a long time, it, it's used in weather predictions and other things as well, but um, so yeah, like as long as you have some kind of like historical trend information, it could be from previous sprints before you know you started on that project it could be you know historical data just in their test management tool that you know this is typically how our projects go it could be like any number of things and we can use it as a starting point mm -hmm. to say um, you know this is kind of generally what we think it's going to be very early on to Justin's point and then we kind of keep a, a rolling update of that to kind of get the updated information as the sprints and releases move on. Yeah, because I would imagine that sometimes if you if you may use uh, or leveraging inputs from you know other parties or other efforts, that information may not have been normalized. But as we actually start using our information, you know, once once we kind of get down the road in a project, then that predictive model becomes even more uh, accurate. Mm -hmm. I, I would assume yeah. is that is that a fair Fair yeah. statement. Yeah. So that's a that's a good uh, you know description of, of the predictive modeling. So so under the mantra of, of test intelligence, uh, wh what are one of the other uh, pillars of test intelligence? Yeah. So there's um, you know there's a kind of another a number of other ways that you know we kind of do some of this uh, intelligence work if you want to think of it like that. So another one that that we've done is. Um, 
use natural language processing and machine learning models to uh, do defect root cause analysis. So take all the information available in a defect, the summary, the comments, the description, the, you know, whatever information's there, um, and attempt to uh, do defect root cause analysis on those. Um, and so typically that's done manually, right? You use the drop down, you choose like this was a coding problem or this was a data problem or whatever. Um, but sometimes the, the choices that are made are a little biased. The developer may not want to say it was code, he feels like it was a data problem or an environment problem and, and vice versa, right? So using that type of mechanism not only tells you how accurate the ones that have been filled in might be, but it just helps automate that process in general. And, and kind of back to the point of hotspots can kind of highlight, you know, 60% of your defects are related to environment problems or whatever. So um, that's another example of one that we've done. Because I, I look at my projects, uh, typically, typically we'll have a daily defect triage meeting where you know you have the requisite stakeholders, uh, you know, look at priority, severity, basically everything that's involved with triage. And if I understand you correctly, you could you can almost do a, a retrospective and see, okay, you know how much bias was present, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, but could you also use that technique to, to even substitute for some of those activities that would normally yeah. occur in that, that triage meeting? Yeah, so you could let the model kind of take at least a first pass at it, right? And you know, maybe you move some things around or whatever, maybe it changes because later on you find more information or something, but it can kind of you know, knock out the first pass of it and, and speed that process up. Yeah. I can see some real value, right? Even even as you begin those meetings, it's like, hey, here's what you know we're seeing. You know, we're seeing a lot of you know in, environment issues or like this percentage or coding this percentage or and yeah, so get, forth. Yeah, we get asked all the time, I think, by clients to to help decipher the defects and root causes and and if we have time to spend where should we go spend it on defects are we having are there consistent issues with how we're doing configurations is there one part of the code within one of our business uh, work streams that, that are that's causing issues so any intelligence we can get on that really helps if we can i mean when it comes down to testing everybody asks When's testing going to be done? And I like to ask, when are the defects going to be fixed, right? Right, yeah. right. Um, so anything we can do to speed that process up and help really figure out where we put our, our horsepower on the on the defects helps out these programs. And, and I would imagine the natural language processing w would come into play because there may be some bias in the way that, that folks categorize things in the test management tool. Usually it's a drop-down menu. It's got to be one of you know yeah, exactly. several categories, but it sounds to me that you can actually analyze the comments and say, hey, does that really reflect the categorization that was chosen? Yeah, you can do that too. I mean, there's a number of varieties to kind of classified data, right? And so some of it can be based on like kind of from a preset list or you can even try to identify, uh, you know, trends or, or information in there that, you know, a particular topic seems to appear more often that doesn't fit these. Or something. So we've, we've talked about the two approaches. I mean, they're, again, test intelligence is not just these, these two approaches, the predictive modeling and the, and the root cause analysis it's 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 a pretty broad topic but as as we we start to to wrap this up what else would you like to share with the audience so i think there's a, a number of other examples um you know one of the things that that we've started to really invest in is you know just being in the business that we're in um you know testing reporting and all the testing intelligence stuff that we've talked about there there are some kind of standard ones that are useful to people right so um uh, so what we've started to do is is build what we call like a, a data mart of all these testing metrics and being able to have like data visualizations on top of those. So the, the predictive model, the reports, the hurricane chart type things um, to be able to take uh, you know any data from any particular project, put it in a standardized format and have some of these tools kind of pre-built on top of that data. Um, so. Uh, you can kind of tweak it and adjust it as you need to for your project, but it's a good place to start to, like a quick way to, to get benefit out of predictive modeling and, and some of these other tools too. Yeah, I think to that point, what what we see is that test intelligence is, is really the intelligence behind the metrics and being able to go process what you have. We live in a world of tons and tons of metrics. and 
even within a project, within a sprint maybe, every day, every week, every month, there might be a new widget you come up with and say, you know, I was looking at these things, I was looking at my hurricane chart and I realized that I'm not accounting for this one particular set of test cases that seems to be running slower than all the rest of them and it's thrown off my model. So now I've got to go tweak my model to, to look at something else or I, I'm looking at the defects and I, and I see a trend with, with one of my workflows. It seems to be having a consistent issue. So now I want to tweak my my pictures a little bit and build a new what I call widget it seems like even on a program once a month there's a new widget there's something something new that we want to add based on how things are evolving or that's right yeah well gentlemen thank you I know we we just scratched the, the surface on that and 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 to that end uh, we uh, have a detailed white paper. Uh, there's a link in the uh, description below as, as well as contact information. Really appreciate the uh, time you've spent with us on Test Talk. Until next time.